Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. With Eve Ensler, women's bodies are to be celebrated and safe, not hidden and violated. She's a playwright, a performer, and an activist. And her creativity and passion have made her an international advocate for women, leading the effort to end the violence against them. Is this what you, hello. Hi. <laughs> Is this what you expected that you were going to be doing with your life? You know, I, I, I don't know if you ever know exactly what you're going to be doing. I, I was talking. I think to, you never do. No, no. I, I was right. talking to my sister about it this weekend because we spent the weekend with my mother. And I think that because my childhood was so fraught and so violent, um, there was part of me, even then, that was figuring out if I could just figure out a way to stop it, you know, within my own family, then maybe other people, that things might get better. So I think that was laid down early on. Um, everything that followed vaginas onward, I'm not sure I had any idea. <laughs> <laughs> and and you were, so, so when you were young, you were always interested in the world around you and trying to make it a better place. I think it was survival. Yeah. I, you know, I think Isn't some people survive by shutting down. So what happened? You were in a violent family. Yeah, my family was, my father was very, very violent. And, um, and created an, an environment of Fear violence. Fear and violence. I, I'm a, I feel sometimes that I'm a consequence of violence. You know, yeah. I'm an outcome. Yeah. And, and I think the way I survived was having fantasies that I could rescue other people. I was so always rescuing dolls and rescuing friends. And be, it was a way of just projecting myself, I think, outward. And, and then I think when you get older, you come to realize, well, how do you heal yourself? It's by serving other people. It becomes this wonderful. But you were always, but then as you became an adult, you were a playwright. I was a playwright. I was a, first I was a poet, then I was a playwright, and I've always been an activist. So I think in my okay. early years, it was really hard to figure out how those two would to live together. together. Yeah. But it, came, it really came together in the vagina monologues or it, before? It first came together <laughs> when, during the nuclear disarmament days, because I was very, I had what I call acute nuclear awareness, where I was aware all the time of the fact that we could disappear if a nuclear bomb went off. What did you call it, acute? Nuclear awareness, nuclear awareness, which felt like neuroses, and I actually went to therapy to try to cure it, and then one day it occurred to me, no, actually, really... I'm afraid of nuclear weapons. <laughs> and at that time, I became very active in the anti-nuclear movement um, and met Joanne Woodward, who I was a huge fan of, and asked her if I could write her a play, which I ended up doing. It was a one-woman show about a woman who leaves home to go to a peace camp to protest nuclear weapons. And she ended up directing Shirley Knight in it, and we toured America during the anti-nuke days, really shaking That's things so up. What was the name? It was called The Depot. Uh -huh. And that was my first time where I saw that Everything. My politics and, 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 and my playwriting and theater could actually come together and be a really effective tool for transformation. And then we came to the vagina monologues. Right. Did you think you were going to really um, <laughs> go on? Tell me. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny because I think um, it, the best things in life are accidents, really. Yeah. I think when you're focusing on something as, as the thing that's going to be your great, important work, it's always a disaster. But when you're just kind of doing something and off... You're Decide relaxed and your, it's working well and you're just getting fun and energetic. And exactly. And you're not really, you know, and yeah. you're not, your ego's not in it. And you're, and so I, I really was just talking to a friend who was going through menopause um, about her vagina, which you'll talk about if you're going through menopause. And she started saying things that really shocked me because she was a feminist and she said, you know, her vagina was finished and dried up and dead and ugly. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I just said to friends, well, what do you think about your vagina? Because it occurred to me, I really didn't know. What, what people, we, we didn't, right. Because no one ever talked about it. Yeah. And every woman I said something to said something more incredible or shocking or funny or outrageous. So I would just kind of write it down, like, oh my God. And slowly but surely, you know, then a, a monologue kind of came together. And then I ended up performing that monologue. And people were like, oh, my God, you have to do this. And, you know, and one, it was really just one thing leading to another. So, and that was the first time you performed? It was. I had done one little piece called um, Dicks in the Desert, which I had done during the first <laughs> Iraqi yeah. war to protest um, what we were doing. But that was more just rage <laughs> <laughs> and having an outlet for it. This was the first time I consciously said, That's enough. maybe yeah. I should do this because I had interviewed so many women and their stories were so special and so private and I felt such a need to protect them. I, well since then you've now come I mean we've gone on we've got the good body which you're in the process really of still 
performing. I right. am. I just finished the Broadway run, and in October I'm doing a national tour. For I six love that. Months. It's a book. Of, it's it's a play or mono, a series of monologues about our bodies and what we think and all the what the pressures yeah, on us just, to change. And, oh. I mean, I, I tell you, after I got done with the vagina monologues, I thought, okay, I kind of like my vagina. I kind yeah. of live in it now. And then I looked down and discovered my not-so-flat post-40 stomach and went, oh, no, it's just moved up. <laughs> <laughs> so the but, book is really an examination of what women do to their bodies in order to be good. And good being thin, anything. flat, silenced, behaved. I mean, I'm almost 75 years old. And I'm still reading the magazines and thinking, can I look like that person who's I what, look like 14 you when I'm years 75. old and everything else? You know, it's just unbelievable, right? It's, um, but it's so interesting because what you've managed to construct a wonderful world around you. I mean, you take the things that you're concerned about, and that's where the creative juices go where all that energy you have goes, and at the same time you're doing what's really the basic principle and spine of your being. I, it's the only way I know that's how so to create good. is to come from that place. Do you place. think that's what makes people really creative? I think the greatest writers or the greatest artists write from where they are, write from what they're de most deeply concerned mm. about. You can't treat the world abstractly. It's not an abstraction. You know, I'm, I've just finished a new play um, that's really about torture because I don't sleep at night thinking about what we're doing in Guantanamo, thinking about Abu Ghraib, thinking about what this country's become in the name of uh, whatever we're calling it, security. Because it's certainly not freedom. It's the name right. in the name of the Bush administration dominating the world. And I, I know that if I don't write about that, I'll go crazy. So for me, it's a way of saving my sanity. And it, it was the truth about my stomach. I mean, you can do so much to alter your stomach. You can exercise and diet and obsess and try different clothes. And then one day you go, what am I doing? Why am I, as a radical feminist, spending my life fixing my stomach? What is going on? And that examination actually helped me. That's so you know, good. Yeah. You know. So you've gone from the, the vagina monologues, which really received all the attention and got everybody's attention also doing it. You took all of that and made it into something that's really trying to change the world, right? Yeah. V-Day. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about V-Day. When did it start? In 1998? 1988 was the first performance. You know, I always say about V-Day that it really is something that had to happen and that I just feel sometimes that I'm in service of, you know, yeah. that I drink my espressos and I try to keep up with it yeah. because the vagina queens are in charge. <laughs> but I, I think what happened when I started doing the play is that so many places I went, women would line up after the shows, huge lines. And I'd like to tell you they were coming to tell me how much they loved the show or like about their great sex lives or their fabulous orgasms. But most women were there to tell me how they'd been beaten or raped or mutilated or gang raped or incested. And I literally was starting to have a breakdown because I would do the show and then all these women would come and it would like enter me in this vulnerable way. And I, I felt the way war photographers feel, that you're taking photographs of people dying and you're not intervening on their behalf. So in 97, I got this great group of women activists together in New York who I'd done a lot of other actions with, and I said, look, we have this play. How could we use it to stop violence against women? Not to maintain it, not to create more systems to keep it in place, but how could we actually end it? And we came up with this idea of V-Day, which is Valentine's Day, ending Violence Day, Vagina Day. And we called all the great actors we knew, from Whoopi Goldberg to Glenn Close to Susan Sarandon to Lily Tomlin. And the first miracle was that they all said yes. And then we got the Hammerstein Ballroom. It was 2,500 seats. <laughs> it was so crazily ambitious and insane. <laughs> and two weeks before the event, the mailing went awry, and we'd only sold 70 seats. Uh. And I had no money, and I took out an ad in the Times with my credit card. Um, for like thirty thousand dollars, and it said very all the, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had no money, by the way. Right. I had like five thousand dollars. You already spent all your vagina gone. monologue money. On... No, I hadn't made the vagina monologue oh, money. Oh, oh. So I had literally five thousand oh. dollars to my name, which I had put down on the space, and then I took this ad out, and it said all these women talking about vaginas all night long, and in forty-eight hours, the whole place sold out. And not only did we make a lot of money, but that night, it was unbelievable. It really launched an energy, like a possibility, a catalyst, an idea that 
in eight years has spread to 76 countries. We've raised $30 million. Um, so last year there were 2,300 productions um, around the world. And it's all just happened, really. I mean, peop women come and go, I have to bring it to Malaysia. Women, I've got to bring it to Islamabad. I've got to bring it to Indiana. I've got to bring it to this college. And they do it, and it happens. And all the money they raise, they keep. So you can literally in a night raise $100,000 or $2,000. And then they give it to different programs in their communities. It must be distributed to beneficiaries that work to stop violence, either rape or sex trafficking or domestic battery or female genital mutilation. What is there any, and this is such a silly question, but is there any country or any place that tugs it more than the others? Yes. I mean, I, I think there are parts of America that are so poor. So unbelievable. So <laughs> unbelievably poor. Um, and I mean, I was just, to be honest, out in Rockaway with my oh. sister, who does an amazing program out there. And it's I just, unbelievable. Isn't I just it? thought to myself, how is it possible that that people are living in such poverty with so little resources, with so little, so little to get by. What I think the unemployment rate is something like 70 percent. And so much misery. So much misery. Same thing with... Um, and uh, the worst part is so little to look forward to. Exactly. And then with all the children and you look at these poor little kids and you think, how are they ever going to get out of this? No, it's shocking. And same with Pine Ridge, you know, reservation. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there are the countries like Afghanistan, where I've spent a lot of time. Um, which are so unbearably poor that, you know, I literally saw children eating dirt when I was there. Um, and they're still that poor, and they're still that oppressed, and have no illusions that the Bush administration has fixed this because it, it's completely unraveled and, and not fixed. And then Iraq, where we had the spotlight this year, where the condition of women has radically radically um, unraveled since the U.S. occupation. The backlash. It's just... A Unbelievable. And in the name of democracy, we have set women back um, where they actually weren't under Saddam Hussein. Yeah. I mean, so there... And, I, and right now I'm feeling very um, pulled towards Africa. I mean, we have, we have mm. quite a few programs now that are in Africa, but the, the, the degree of AIDS in women, the connection between women being raped and used and violated and AIDS, I find um, just unbearable, unbearable. It's so hard that you have a wonderful story in um, where? Is it in the Vagina Warriors? No, it's in... I don't know where it Which is. Which one is The good it? body, I think. The tree, tr what do you call it? The tree, it? yes. The tree, I, the woman in Africa. It was, Maya. it's stupendous about the strength and she's saying to you, look at how strong you are. And no, she's, she was, she was a real turning point because yeah. I would go around the world saying to women, do you like your body? And every woman would invariably say, I hate my thighs or <laughs> I hate my butt or I hate my arms or I like my, but I said this to her. She was in the middle of the Rift Valley, you know, she was yeah. Maasai, and she looked at me like I was a Martian, and she said, like my body. I love my, oh, my body. My body. I love my body. Look at my hands. I love my hands. Look at my fingers. Ooh, my little crescent moons and my arms so strong. And she went on, and I was like, oh, my God, I don't know how to do that. And she was like, what's wrong with your body? And I said, my stomach. And she said, your stomach? Your stomach is meant to be seen. And she said, Eve, look at that tree. Do you see that tree? Do you like that tree? Now look at that tree. Do you, do you see that tree? Do you say that tree isn't pretty because it doesn't look like that tree? Do you say that tree is ugly because it doesn't? You're a tree. I'm a tree. You've got to love your tree. Love your tree, Eve. <laughs> and I say to people, it changed my life. That's so wonderful. That's I literally walk story. around seeing women as trees now. And everybody is, and there's no ugly trees. Right. I've never seen right. an ugly tree. That's true. It's absolutely true. It's a wonderful lesson. Does she know how her influence has come all the she way died. to the, yeah. Oh, but I'm you know sorry. what? She was she was she was in all nearly right. eighty. And, Don't say she no, was no, seventy-five. No, I, I took it back when you said it. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> all right. Now let's. You 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 always you've said that you we were talking about Guantanamo and you have a new project going on. So let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I I feel that there is a the winds are turning. I I think that. I just really feel that something's beginning to shift in the country. The fact that they can't get anyone to join the army. Right. The fact that parents are now standing up and opposing anyone joining. I think people are really beginning to get this war and what's going on. And frankly, traveling now, as I do, and I spend a lot of time in Muslim countries, the rage at this country for what we have done at places like Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib is so incredibly Terrible. insane. And rightly so. I mean, what are we doing? So 
I think there's a real movement afoot with Carter coming out and actually Republican Congress people and senators speaking out, I, and the fact that the Bush and Cheney can't agree on this. I think there's a real movement afoot to shut down Guantanamo, which will be the beginning of shifting the practices that are going on in prisons, not only uh, overseas, I might add, but in our own prisons right here at home. So on July 4th, we are calling a huge group of coalition, a coalition of groups is calling for in actions and smaller actions all across the country that in the name of freedom and independence that we shut down Guantanamo. And we make that our first victory in the new wave, which is really going to begin to turn this country around and take back this country and take back our values and take back ethics and take back the way we treat people, any people. You're you know? so filled with passion. Why aren't more people filled with passion these days? I think the plot of this administration has been quite brilliant. I think yeah. it has made people very, very afraid. You see, the drive and the dream of Americans used to be about service, used to be about connection, used to be about freedom. It's now about security. Mm -hmm. I think the all I, kinds of security. It doesn't matter. It's just security. Yeah. The idea that anyone believes they're ever going to be secure is so crazy. We die. We get right. old. Things fall apart. People leave us. People come. There is no security. Security is is completely elusive. It's impossible. So the idea that the whole country now is running around trying to be secure is it's kind of. But do you? I, I'm not so sure that it's. Only the security from the farm. I mean, that's what they're trying to sell no, us. No, I think there's, I don't it, think there's this are, illusion yeah. that people will, th that somehow security is important. But and it's a, well, when you said security, I was going to say all kinds of security. It's it's keeping a job, mm -hmm. so you get the um, the fear of being fired. That's so right. you get that kind of self censorship in different places because you're not going to. It's a lot of self censorship, thinking this is going to get me into trouble. I'm not going to do it. That's right. You find it in politics. They're not going to stand up to say what they really believe because then That's they won't. Right. Get the votes. It's just all over. It permeates us, and I don't know what really happened and why that was. Well, I think also there's something. Look, what is life? Life yeah. is this great big adventure yeah. that you, you you kind of throw yourself into, and every day you learn something, you become something, right. you evolve. If you're taught that your idea here is to be secure, you don't go out of your house, right. you don't go out of your you country. Don't do anything. You create a hard matter identity where you're either a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, you're bisexual or you're homosexual or you're no sexual, or you, you get these hard matter ideas of yourself that you never venture out of because someone might touch you or change you or transform you. Yeah. And that isn't living. And then we do this other thing too, is where we, well, everybody needs money in your organizations or something. So, I mean, just locally, I, when, when I think of fear, I, I think, for instance, Giuliani cast a spell total. of total fear. I mean, it was not a spell, it was more. And so even organizations that used to talk up were afraid to yeah. talk up because then they don't get the money to That's fund right. their work. But also we find ourselves lobbying against each other. Totally. That's well, that's the genius problem. of fear because yes. everybody gets so territorial yeah. and gets so about if I lose this, I lose everything. Yeah. I just say lose everything. Exactly. Get What's into the point? it. Lose Be a it. hero. <laughs> lose it. What, what, what do you keep that heroism? For? You're going to die yeah. anyway. What are you hoarding it up for? Right. You know. And the irony, of course, is that as soon as you speak up. Everybody speaks up around you yes. because everybody feels what you're feeling. Yeah, they just haven't had to. the courage. You know, I, I gave this speech, the commencement speech recently at Manhattanville, and I was really nervous because it was a fairly, you know, it, it was a straightforward yeah. speech about security. And just, I, I, I said to the students, I am not encouraging you to grow up and be secure. I'm encouraging you to grow up and be insecure and to find the breadth and the depth. And the, And at the end of it, I tell you, 3,000 people stood up. And I thought to myself, That's okay. Very good. Something's going on here that we have to trust really is underneath all this, which is that people know they're not going to be secure. Nothing. And yeah. why do you want to be secure? Right. Like what? You're going to know the rest of your life. This is what it is Just forever. Plot it goes back to what I said. Is this what you expected to do with your it's, life? And you said, who knows what we were going to do with our lives? It, that's the it's, great news. Right. Experience. That's, we have this one life, and it's very short. And one of the things about traveling, which is I th why I think Americans all need to get passports, and they all need to go places, because I read someplace that 70% of Americans don't have passports. The world is incredible. Yeah. It will teach you everything. It will free you from the bondage of fear. Because what happens is you'll suddenly be in the Rift Valley in Kenya and you'll look at the sky and know the sky in a way you've never known the sky, which will teach you something about you that you've never, never. known about you. 
Why do we want to be this limited, tiny, yeah. insulated, isolated, atomized being? Bitter and bitter and, and fearful angry and, and everything. Now that's the one another wonderful part about women, though, isn't it? There is something so special about what we call sisterhood. Right? What is it? It it's isn't amazing. a monthly. You read once some. I mean, you wrote once. I think I read it that you talk to somebody and you can just see it in their eyes that immediately there's a rapport, yeah. right? Yeah. I, well, I mean, that's what the whole Vagina Warrior yeah. concept oh, that's is the, about. Yes. Because when I would travel at the beginning and I would meet women in all these different countries, mainly women who had survived terrible things, whether they were in Bosnian rape camps or, you know, in Afghan refugee camps or in, um, you, you know, with, with bruises all over their arms in the ghettos of Cairo, or I would meet these women everywhere I went who were these lights. They were just beaming lights who had managed to take that suffering and not inflict it on anyone else, yeah. not get weapons of mass destruction, not occupy, not invade, not damn it. But instead, they actually grieved it. They felt what had happened mm -hmm. to them. And that grieving led them in a whole different direction. Gave them the strength. To heal and work and support other people. people. And these women, there are thousands of them, and men, because there are many vagina warriors who are men, all across the planet, who are literally standing up for women in communities everywhere. They don't get any recognition. They don't do it for money. They don't do it to be on television. They don't do it to be heroes. They do it because they have to do it. Because that is the driving spirit of their lives. And I believe that as more and more women and men become vagina warriors, we're creating another species that's slowly evolving and growing up and growing up, and eventually it will be the dominant species. So when we talk about vagina women, I mean, warriors, the, the warriors vagina warriors, give me just a nice definition. I would say that a vagina warrior is a woman or man who has suffered incredible violence or witnessed it, and rather than getting a gun or a machete or a weapon of mass destruction, they grieve it, they feel it, they allow it to transform, and then they devote their lives to stopping it happening to anybody and else. And the violence can be really of a broad kind. Broad kind. It, it can be a be Palestinian woman <laughs> who's been, you know, yeah. beaten down at, at checkpoints every day. It can be poverty that is so. It can be rape. It can be incest. But what's incredible about these women? And Agnes is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. This is Agnes here. Mm -hmm. Agnes is is really my teacher. She was a woman who had been mutilated female generally mutilated as a little girl. Her clitoris was removed against her will. And it had destroyed her life. I mean, she had no pleasure. She could not have sex. It, w it wasn't a good experience. And she made a decision that rather than going and getting a razor or a glass shard, she would devote her life to stopping it. So for eight years, she walked through the Rift Valley with this little box. It had a female torso, and it had va vaginal replacement parts. And she would teach girls and boys and mothers and fathers what a healthy vagina looked like and what a mutilated vagina looked like. In the years that she walked, she saved 1,500 girls from being cut. And she created an alternative ritual, which involved yeah. girls coming of age and dancing and getting their periods without getting the cut. And they did theater, and they got cows, which was my favorite part. When we met her, we said, what could V-Day do for you? Because V-Day never goes into countries to tell people what to do. Right, we support the women who are doing mm -hmm. the work on the ground. And she said, well, Eve, if you bought me a Jeep, I could get around a lot faster. So the first year, Vide bought her a Jeep. The second year, we went back, and I said, okay, anything. And she said, well, if you give us money, I could open a house, and girls could run away, and they could save their clitorises, and they mm -hmm. could go to school, and they wouldn't be forced into marriage. And uh, two years ago, we... Opened? The, well, Agnes opened the first safe house in Narok. We went for the opening, probably one of the greatest days of my life. Hundreds of African girls in the sunlight, dancing, singing a song, how the time of FGN had ended, and there was this house. And she has now saved hundreds of girls. And she has just been elected deputy mayor of her community. Oh, great. And was reviled <laughs> and detested as she began this movement to stop that tradition. So it just goes to show you that if you stand up and you say what everybody knows in their heart, you turn the community around and you become the leader. So it's also having these principles, right? And the belief in the principles, mm -hmm. the basic, that basic thing. How do we instill those principles? Have we lost those, do you think, in the country? I, I think they're momentarily disappeared. Yeah. I think we have to, when I hear things like Fox News saying, well, we only made the soldiers, you know, urinate on themselves and we just kept them in a box for four days and we, that was all. I think, where are we? What's happening? 
Um, I think what we all have to do is stop being afraid to stand up and say what we believe, stop being afraid right. of having morality, stop being afraid to have beliefs that matter, stop being afraid to say that's wrong and that, that shouldn't be happening. And you know, it's so much easier, it was a political trip, a trick I adapted, is when in doubt and when in trouble resort to principle. Mm -hmm. And somehow when you stood up there, and even if you were nervous, it always helped a little bit if you could make your speech or something, if you're principled about what you're doing, you gain, I think, respect from people. Totally. And an acceptance of what your principles are. And as you said, once you say it, then some other people will come along with you. There's such a power in that concept of principle and of that wonderful communal sharing of feelings and, also, and things. also, what we've come to with political people is nobody sticks to principles. You see people who are running for mm. office, there's no, there are so few people you can believe in because suddenly they shift with whatever yeah, the Of course, they have no principles. I mean, it's like a career that they're going to advance to the next. It, and, and I believe that if we had people who actually were leaders, we would have a new I, left. I agree with, I'm We would totally have agree. a new left. Right. We, somebody who would just stand up and say, here's what I believe. And I'm not shifting off that. I'm not going to say, okay, now I'm going to tell you that I kind of believe in abortion, right. not fully believe in abortion. Right. Well, I'm not really for the war, but I'm going to support the war because that will get me ahead. No, I don't believe in the war. That's what I stand for. Okay, here, you know what you're getting. You know what you're buying. This is a person who will not take you to war. I will do everything in my power to keep us out of war. As opposed to, well, if I kind of move that way, the... And, yeah. and there's so few people like that. Because anymore. that just brings us back to this common mediocrity yeah. that this reigning supreme. So what we need are more people like you. And you. In the colors <laughs> that you're wearing and the red glasses and the energy and the passion and the principles that are going to make it change the world, right? Well, it's got to be fun. Yeah. You know, if we don't have a good time and if it's not sexual and alive, yeah. people don't want to join us anyway. Right. And, you know, and look, you were one of my heroes. Oh, I, please. You, no, you truly <laughs> are. You. I'm so honored to be well, on your show. I'm so delighted to have Talk you. Talk about Vagina Warriors. I mean, you have been right. here forever, right. hoeing and keeping and, you know, keeping a vision alive for a Thank lot of us. Thank you very much. Now yeah. we have to say goodbye. Okay. What's your granddaughter's name? Coco. And she's going to be one of our oh, warriors she's, by she's definite. The deal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.